Thank you very much. So I now will call on uh, Gabriel Appley, uh, who is the Quain Professor of Physics at UCL and from the beginning has been the director uh, of the LCM uh, after he uh, joined from NEC and from Bell Labs and from MIT and all sorts of other illustrious places. Gabriel. So uh, I want to thank you uh, for uh, spending your afternoon with us. Uh, I think we are the only thing separating you from that uh, wine that you're all uh, looking forward uh, to. So we'll try to make this as uh, short and painless as possible. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief overview of, of who we are, what we do. Uh, some overlap with the brochure, uh, hopefully not too much. So there is something new uh, that uh, you can learn. Uh, we have to start uh, first uh, with our definition of nanotechnology. I mean, there are literally uh, in this world, especially in Asia these days, there are hundreds of nanotechnology centers, and uh, there are as many definitions of nanoscience and nanotechnology as there are nanotechnologists. This is a definition that we've uh, chosen to adopt in London, uh, which we believe uh, distinguishes ourselves from uh, all of the other great nanoscientists uh, who have been working in London since the days of uh, uh, the beginning of chemistry and the beginnings of molecular biology. Now technology is the ability to model, characterize, and manipulate matter on the submicron scale using the tools developed for the semiconductor industry, that's what we call top-down, and modern uh, macromolecular uh, chemistry, that's what we call uh, bottom-up. And actually all of the images uh, are, are work that actually have been performed by the LCM. When I gave these kinds of talks seven or eight years ago, uh, usually the work, uh, uh, the pictures that were shown were, were taken from uh, uh, Bell Labs or IBM slides. Uh, now they're all around. That's a, a, real, uh, a real advance that we've made in London over the last, uh, over the last uh, five, six years. Uh, now, we live, of course, in a context. We have all these great tools, this great science. Uh, there's not much point. Uh, in asking certainly for public money unless we do something uh, for the public. And I'm just going to show you a few uh, graphs uh, which I think crystallize uh, what uh, society expects from us. Uh, here's a graph of the uh, rise in uh, health care costs uh, in the UK. UK is about maybe 10 years, uh, 15 years behind the US. But uh, in, in terms of uh, sort of the fraction of the GDP, uh, that's taken up by uh, spending on, on, on health care. You can see over the last decade, uh, that fraction has gone up by a factor of two. Uh, here's another challenge. Uh, no matter what uh, various right-wing politicians want you to believe, the temperatures are going up uh, in the world, and they, they, uh, they're going to continue to go up given the amount of CO2 and other gases that we've released into the atmosphere. Uh, here's another challenge. Uh, you probably all realized as you've uh, upgraded your laptops that each succeeding generation is warmer than the last. Now, no doubt you're, you're familiar with Moore's law for computer performance, but there's a similar law for the heat that's dissipated in, in computation and the, even things that don't seem terribly computational like your, your Google searches. Uh, we're today uh, running with laptops which typically, you know, when they're uh, powered up, uh, dissipate, a, you know, a power similar to that of a light bulb. Uh, types of uh, computers that uh, Google uses for your internet searches uh, have uh, power densities similar to a panini toaster. And uh, as we upgrade the hardware, uh, we're approaching actually power densities similar to those in, in nuclear reactors. So information technology, which we depend on to solve some of the other problems I just mentioned, uh, itself is headed towards some kind of brick wall. So the London Center for Nanotechnology aims to actually help to fix these problems using uh, the exploitation of nanotechnology. It wants, of course, to do excellent science at the same time. But, of course, the excellent science on some time scale, maybe 50 years, 100 years, is to solve real problems for real people. Structure is very simple. There are two owners. And uh, we formed a multidisciplinary research center which combines uh, these two uh, great uh, institutions. Uh, timeline. 
very simple. Uh, actually, uh, the original uh, thought behind the LCM and the original uh, strategy was formulated during the uh, Imperial UCL uh, uh, merger discussions, uh, actually uh, nine years ago. And uh, then, uh, actually, those, uh, that merger, as you know, did, didn't uh, quite work out, but the LCM actually remained as one of the few uh, fossils uh, from that era. Uh, at around the same time, uh, we be began to uh, design and build uh, the, uh, the structure that uh, exists uh, in Bloomberry, Bloomsbury. Uh, and actually, the design and value engineering phase went through uh, 2004. Construction uh, was started uh, in 2003. Uh, in uh, we uh, occupied the Bloomsbury New Build and had our original uh, event, celebratory event, uh, for the inauguration of that uh, at UCL uh, in uh, November of 2006. And uh, the, uh, a, a suite of offices and labs with LCM branding was completed here in South Kensington uh, in 2008. And uh, we just held our, uh, our, we're holding today our fifth anniversary and uh, the uh, uh, meeting uh, of our newly constituted external board also this morning. Uh, the two images I'm showing you here of two people uh, who were extremely instrumental in the formation of the center. Uh, and the, the two people are, are uh, Professor Mike Horton, who is uh, essentially uh, a pioneer, was the pioneer of, of, of uh, a pioneer of nano, uh, nanomedicine, uh, particularly uh, sort of the, the nanomechanics of, of, uh, of, of medical phenomena. And, uh, he had a, a large uh, laboratory at the Department of Medicine, uh, which he actually then moved as an anchor tenant into the new building uh, in 2006. Uh, the other person many of you know uh, is the former chief scientist of, uh, uh, of Harwell. Uh, he then became uh, a professor at, uh, at UCL. Uh, both of these men actually died uh, within the last uh, uh, two years. Both of them were very influential uh, throughout, throughout the world and, and uh, it is their vision actually that I think we should be celebrating uh, today as, as much as anybody else's. So moving, moving along, what's the structure today? So we have roughly 30 million pounds worth of uh, investment in world-class facilities and uh, well over 200 uh, multidisciplinary staff. These people are drawn from numerous faculties in the two colleges, and the faculties include medicine, engineering, and, and science. And, and they bring a set of competencies which are outlined in these blue boxes uh, in the four sort of key uh, underpinning uh, areas. One is uh, such a computer-aided design or theory. Uh, another is, is characterization. A third is nanofabrication. And the last is, of course, uh, uh, nanosystems, uh, you know, which, which is, at the end of the day, what you need to create solutions for real people. And, as I said before, the focus is on using this expertise on solving sort of the big issues in healthcare, information technology, and planet care. Facilities in central London, this is a new building uh, that is now no longer so new and uh, way too small for us. Uh, in, in Bloomsbury. And uh, then uh, on the images that you see uh, uh, on your right uh, are, are various uh, machines, uh, very expensive machines uh, that uh, we've actually won through uh, peer review uh, with Absurk, uh, uh situated in both, uh, in both, uh, on both sites. Now, I'm just going to give you a few uh, examples of, of things uh, that we do in these major areas of delivery. In fact, just one or two each, rather than <coughs> bewildering you with lists. So, healthcare, what have we been doing? Well, we've been looking at DNA on the nanometer scale. Actually, on, on the left, you see uh, an atomic force micrograph of, of DNA at the top, and at the bottom you see something called a, a, a Kelvin probe map of DNA, which is actually sort of an electrical probe of DNA. Now this is work done at, at as it happens in the lab of Bart Hugenbaum at, at, at UCL. Uh, meanwhile, uh, over at Imperial, actually uh, uh, two uh, chemists actually were working to also actually use those electrical properties to actually read out the actual sequence of individual DNA molecules. Okay. In other words, they want to not rely on standard uh, PCR type 
uh, methods for replicating uh, genetic information. They just want to read individual strands of, uh, of DNA, just as in the old days you used to read uh, magnetic tapes uh, through a reader. That's an example of, of work in the biomedical arena. We move along to information technology, uh, something which, uh, which has drawn a huge amount of attention uh, in, the, in the press uh, and also the scientific community in the last three, four years, has been work that was pioneered uh, at the two colleges on the concept of magnetricity. As you may remember, uh, magnetism and electricity traditionally thought to be very different in that uh, in, in, uh, in magnetism, uh, isolated uh, charges don't exist. They always appear in pairs as dipoles, whereas, of course, electrical charges exist as positive and negative, uh, negative uh, uh, entities. And uh, what uh, Steve Brownwell and colleagues uh, discovered was that in certain media, actually, uh, magnetism can exhibit those, uh, the, the single charges that you normally associate only with electricity. So that's why it's called magnetricity. Now, that's very, very basic science at the moment. On the very applied side, of course, uh, you've all heard about the Center for Organic Electronics here at Imperial. Uh, and uh, people actually, the, the ultimate, of course, organic, cheap organic material is paper. These are actually some integrated circuits that uh, uh, Arokia Nathan and his colleagues uh, simply wrote on a piece of paper. So that's information technology perhaps for today. And on the left is information technology for uh, tomorrow. Planet care. Uh, there's, uh, of course, a lot that uh, you've probably heard about the need for alternative means of energy storage. There's a lot of work on, on batteries, but also hydrogen storage. Uh, colleague uh, Neil Skipper uh, and, uh, and his uh, friends up at the Rutherford Lab have invented a, a new uh, polymeric way to actually uh, uh, store uh, hydrogen uh, and uh, what you're seeing here is, is a micrograph of, these, of this uh, polymer network. Uh, at the same time, of course, we're still worried about uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, our current uh, uh, technology of, of uh, oil, uh, uh, just exploiting uh, mineral oil. Uh, he's actually also been working on how to get rid of the asphalt teens uh, which clog up uh, the uh, pipelines uh, going to uh, wellheads. Uh, this act actually, even though it's a mega problem, it's actually uh, very much a problem with the rheology and the stickiness of these asphaltines, which make this uh, black goo. Uh, Milo Schaefer has been working on uh, structural uh, materials, lighter, better uh, structural materials, which will uh, allow uh, us to uh, save fuel when we uh, fly around in the air or drive our cars around. Uh, these are some micrographs of materials he's made where he's spun together carbon nanotubes as well as traditional carbon, uh, uh, as, as well as, uh, traditional carbon uh, fibers. So those are just some vignettes, uh, just some hard facts. Uh, we've uh, really uh, ramped up our publications since we started in, uh, in 2006 as a, as a formal center. Uh, we're ramping up both the, the quality and, and the number. Uh, we have now very competitive, uh, competitive figures in, in both uh, areas, and also we publish a lot in high-impact uh, journals like uh, Science, uh, Nature Group uh, publications, and uh, the NAS. Uh, let me mention uh, another type of output. I've talked, focused mainly now on science and, and nice uh, uh, pictures of, uh, of, uh, of images of scientific experiments. Uh, that, uh, let me talk a little bit about, uh, about the, the broader economic context. Uh, this shows a, another type of problem that our society is, is facing. Uh, we, uh, I showed you at the beginning where, where the planet's warming up, uh, healthcare costs are going out of sight, but uh, we also have a problem of, of uh, keeping our, uh, the Western economies uh, going. And uh, it's rather ominous that a, any index that you use of, of sort of uh, economic success uh, is, is actually not progressing very much uh, over the last uh, 10 years. This just happens to be the S&P index, uh, which has essentially been treading water you know, since, uh, since around 1998. Uh, uh, it's ominous, of course, that, that what seems to be going on in the West now is quite similar to what's been going on in Japan for the last 20 years. So how are we going to help create the jobs that voters demand? 
And of course, there's several ways to do this. One is education and training. We train PhD students. We have master's courses. We have lots of uh, research associates. And our alumni actually do get jobs in industry, government, and academia worldwide where they bring the problem-solving ethos that they acquired at the LCM out, uh, into, the, uh, out into the real world. Uh, we also engage uh, in uh, a lot of uh, commercialization activities. This is simply uh, a, a partial uh, set of, of companies uh, where uh, uh, LCM people have either been, uh, been founding members or uh, have been acting to license their technology. Now, there are lots of opportunities going forward for the future. Big opportunity, for example, is in biomedicine with the formation of the Francis uh, Crick Institute at St. Pancras, uh, at Saint, near St. Pancras Station. Uh, this is a, uh, an initiative which will create an NIH Institute scale uh, entity in, in London to, uh, to, to promote essentially high-class translational uh, biomedicine. And we really need to collaborate with them. Another opportunity is presented by uh, sort of the ongoing revolution in brain science. In fact, uh, these are some uh, images with a very, very small voxel size that uh, Michael Hauser and Dark Roth has been, have actually been making using a tool from the semiconductor industry in our center, namely a FIPSAM. And they're actually also uh, creating a, a new institute, uh, this uh, Sainsbury Wellcome Institute for uh, Neural Computation. Uh, other opportunities exist in our partnerships with labs elsewhere, particularly our partnership with uh, large facilities. Uh, there's been a revolution in the generation of coherent short wavelength light, uh, which has uh, essentially been epitomized by the opening of the Stanford uh, free electron laser uh, within the last year. And uh, these kinds of facilities where we, it, we firmly intend to be, be key, uh, key partners uh, are going to allow us uh, to continue sort of our pioneering efforts on X-ray scattering, both for the physical sciences, these are femtosecond resolution measurements of atomic coordinates uh, in, in an oxide. Uh, these are uh, very recent uh, measurements uh, performed on uh, the uh, structure of the hairs, the sticky hairs on E. coli, also performed uh, by, uh, by LCN scientists. But the new sources are going to completely change this game and we definitely intend to be there. Last opportunity I'll talk about is, is, is the, the opportunities presented by quantum engineering, where we can now plan to build quantum devices rather than merely observe them. So, we believe we've had five years of impact, and many years to come, many more to come, and uh, of course the reason this is all happening is because of the tremendous uh, uh, human uh, resource that we have at uh, both uh, Imperial and UCL and uh, increasingly our friends uh, internationally. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>